it comes in a t telephone call at 2 p.m. Stockholm time. That's 7 a.m. in Princeton. <laughs> so, uh, in fact, I was asleep. My wife got up to answer the phone and said, there's a reporter on here that says you've been <laughs> awarded the Nobel Prize. I never did actually hear directly from the uh, Nobel Committee in Stockholm because the phone just uh, rang off the hook for the next uh, hour or so and finally I unplugged the phone and went to work. There had been hints over the years that this was very important research and might be recognized in such a way as that, but it wasn't something that we were waiting for. So obviously it's a very great honor and a, and a wonderful surprise. Princeton has been a great place for me, and, and I've always been grateful for all the support I got here. I've been a professor of physics here for, what is it, 30-some years. I retired a couple of years ago. I have the luxury of keeping this office and, and keeping myself very much engaged in, in what's going on in the physics department. When I was asked whether I might be interested in joining it in the late 1970s, I was at the University of Massachusetts, was not looking uh, particularly to go anywhere else, but. Uh, with an invitation from a place like Princeton, it was very hard not to pay very close attention to it. And when I finished my PhD work at Harvard, uh, I was staying on there for another year as a postdoctoral research fellow uh, with more or less a blank slate to work on whatever uh, attracted me. And it happened that uh, within a few weeks of the time when I defended my thesis, uh, a paper was published announcing the discovery of a new and very strange kind of radio source, uh, those things that have become since then known as pulsars. And so I got in on the exploration of those objects very quickly, soon after their initial discovery, and uh, basically spent all of my professional life uh, elucidating their uh, detailed structure and what sort of physics we can learn from them. It was a very surprising discovery. We learned within a few years that they are neutron stars. Neutron stars had been predicted in the 1930s. Uh, but it was more or less thought that they might never be observable because they're so small that uh, even if they're very hot uh, at interstellar distances, they would be totally indetectable. But it wasn't guessed at the time that they would also be strongly magnetized and uh, spin rapidly. And that basically gives them the capability of generating very large electromagnetic fields, which translate across the galaxy as, as radio waves. It's always exciting to, to uh, learn something new and to, uh, to learn something that nobody knew before. We, at the time, had no clue where it was going to lead us, so we were kind of sniffing around looking for something interesting to, to work on. I began a project in the early 1970s aimed at detecting more of them and trying to find out how they're distributed throughout our galaxy, how their distribution through the galaxy might differ from that of other types of stars, and if so, why. And it happened that during that exploration, we happened upon a particularly interesting object, a so-called binary pulsar, one that's orbiting around another star. And that's the work for which I spent the next 30 years uh, pursuing in various ways. It was a time when so-called small laboratory mini-computers were first uh, available. They were roughly the size of a refrigerator and weighed about as much. They allowed us to, to make direct uh, digital uh, analysis of the data from a radio telescope, which had not previously been done very much. And it happens that the pulsar signals vary rapidly. Uh, they, they are a series of pulses, like the ticks of a clock, and uh, having the ability to digitize the data and to process it with a uh, laboratory computer was a big advantage, and we were among the first to do that. Filled in a missing link, if you like, in the chain of stellar evolution so that we understood much better what happens to stars, how they end their lives. It becomes a so-called supernova, and what's left behind is a spinning neutron star, which uh, is a pulsar. My favorite radio telescope is the one in Puerto Rico, near the city of Arecibo. That's called the Arecibo Telescope. People know, know of it. it. It shows up in things like James Bond movies from time to time and the movie Contact. It's a giant telescope. It, it's uh, about 1,000 feet in diameter in the shape of a bowl uh, on its back looking straight up. It can be steered by moving the focus antenna, which is on a tower up above the, the reflector. We basically are simply trying to understand nature's laws more precisely. There was actually a lot of controversy over the years, up until the 1980s even, after the discovery of this pulsar, about whether gravitational waves really do exist or not. And so uh, the experiment laid that controversy to rest. They clearly are uh, an important phenomenon. Einstein was uh, quoted as saying he thought there was no end to the more uh, deeper and, and more complete understanding of nature. Other very distinguished people, Richard Feynman for example, have thought quite the opposite, that 
discovering the laws of nature is like discovering uh, America. Once you've done it, you've done it, and it's over. Uh, but uh, I, I tend to, uh, to, to doubt that uh, we're at least close to that point where that could be true. All the men in my family went to Haverford for, for years, in fact, uh, all the way back to the founders. Uh, uh, so uh, there was never much question, I think, when I was growing up that that's where I'd be headed, and uh, I certainly have had no regrets since either. Well, I didn't know much about what physics was really like, but I did discover fairly quickly at Haverford that I enjoyed the physics labs a lot, the physics course that I took early uh, first semester, and uh, discovered that I just was probably going to be uh, heading off in that direction. Two of my favorites were Faye Selov, the only woman physicist that I knew as an undergraduate, and uh, a, a wonderful woman who uh, was a dear friend of Haverford undergraduates in general. And another one was Tom Benham, who uh, at the time uh, was the only blind professor on campus. He lectured from Braille Notes and uh, uh, checked our homework by having us come in and, and uh, report on it uh, one problem at a time individually. So we all had uh, basically one-on-one -on -one tutorial sessions with Tom Benham uh, whenever we were taking his courses. He was a superb teacher. The senior thesis was a great experience for me. Uh, it was essentially something I did on my own uh, with uh, you know, advice from time to time when I needed it, but principally on my own. So it was, I, I learned how you do sometimes go down blind alleys that don't work out and you have to think of another way to do it if that didn't work. Uh, and it was a fun project. I built a radio telescope that actually existed there on the Haverford campus for a while. Was yeah. there a radio telescope there? There was indeed. And it was built by students and faculty? It was built by one student. <laughs> okay. <That's> <laughs> and no faculty. <laughs> but those were happy years. I, I really enjoyed my time at Haverford. I enjoyed the uh, living with other students. Uh, we had great roommates and, and a good time together. Uh, I enjoyed the intramural sports, which I played a lot of, and uh, our basketball team was undefeated for a couple of years, and, and we had a lot of fun with that as well. And the other thing that certainly Haverford left me with was, was that ability of thinking for one, myself, uh, learning for myself. I remember the first year or so of, of my coursework at Harvard, uh, thinking this is as hard as I've ever worked, and it was, uh, but you know, I had the tools necessary to do it. I think it's a uh, distinguished, a uh, small liberal arts college that gives uh, one particular type of student a very good start in life, no matter what he or she may go on to do. Um, and uh, I think it's filled that niche extremely well in, in all of my lifetime at least.